Welcome back for lecture five. Today we're gonna to talk about approximate differential privacy. Approximate differential privacy is a slight weakening of or a relaxation of pure differential privacy, which we've saw, studied so far. This relaxation was introduced by Dwork, Kentapati, McSherry, uh, Mirnov, and Naor in 2006, and it's a very useful one. Um, in particular, it'll have a marginally weaker privacy guarantee, but it'll allow us to add significantly less noise in some cases to achieve essentially the same, qualitatively the same type of privacy guarantee. Um, and one of the sort of things that it permits, which uh, gives it this much more power, is something known as advanced composition. Uh, this is something we'll talk about in the next lecture, but for today we're going to focus on the uh, definition and some basic algorithms for approximate differential privacy. So let's talk about the definition first. That's a good place to start. But before we get to the definition, let's talk about what the wrong definition of differential privacy was. And we talked about this a little bit uh, in the previous lectures. So here's one wrong way to define pure differential privacy, or just differential privacy in general. So here we're saying that, recall that uh, I'm skipping the definitions of what these all are, but there is sort of the same that we've seen before. Um, M is going to be an algorithm, X and X prime are neighboring data sets, and S is any sort of subset of the range of the algorithm that we're privatizing. Um, sorry, if M. And one way to do it is by wrong is by saying that, you know, the probability of each event is within an additive epsilon of the other event. So for reasons that I won't get into uh, in this lecture, but I'll refer you to section 1.6 of Badan, if we have a small epsilon in this case, in this definition, uh, then this is like, this, this will give you uh, bad accuracy. Like essentially you can say that uh, with a small epsilon here, then it'll essentially say that the answer that M gives has to be independent of the data set, which of course is not gonna give you an, a good answer. And in the case where you have say a large epsilon, then uh, this is a very weak privacy guarantee. Um, and we'll see some examples of why uh, this is a bit later on in today's lecture actually. Um, if you set sort of this additive parameter to be large, we'll see what can go wrong. So these are, you know, this is the wrong way to define differential privacy saying you have this additive guarantee, but it turns out that combining this type of uh, additive guarantee with the previous multiplicative guarantee we had as well seems to be the right thing. And this is where we come in with the definition of approximate differential privacy. So approximate differential privacy is written right here. And let's go over the definition, let's read through it. So we say that an algorithm M, which maps from some domain X and takes an N data points to some other, uh, to some range Y, is a uh, epsilon delta differentially private. So this is a new parameter we have here, delta. Uh, it'll be epsilon delta DP. We sometimes call this uh, approximate DP when uh, delta is greater than zero. If for all neighboring data sets x, x prime, which are in the domain and all uh, subsets of the range, then we have the following type of privacy guarantee. So you can see that this is essentially, you know, if, if you ignore this delta, then this is the exact same definition we've seen for differential privacy before. But now when you consider this delta, it gives you a little bit of slack in terms of the sort of privacy guarantee that you have. So in particular, let's, let's uh, look at a special case. In particular, if uh, delta equals zero, then this is, this is just the exact same as uh, the case we've already looked at, the definition we've already seen. So this is called pure DP when delta is equal to zero. Um, yeah, but I guess it gets a little bit more interesting when uh, you know delta is not equal to zero. And we'll, we'll study that a bit more. Uh, yeah, is there anything else I wanna say? No, let's move on. Okay, so this is, this is like uh, the definition of approximate differential privacy. You know, but what, what does this really mean? How do we interpret this? How can we think of this? And in order to think of how, how we'd interpret this, let's, let's turn to something known as the privacy loss random variable. If you think back to the hypothesis testing uh, type of framework of uh, thinking of differential privacy, this is a, a little bit similar in some sense uh, because it kind of indicates, it, it kind of says based on an outcome, does it tell you whether, you know, we were looking at M on X or M on X prime? So let's, let's be a bit more precise and see what the privacy loss random variable is. So let's define in the following way. We're going to let Y and Z be two random variables. 
And the privacy loss random variable is distributed first by drawing t according to uh, to the uh, random variable y. So you sort of draw a sample or draw an outcome according to y. And then you output the following value. Output the log of the following ratio of probabilities. The probabilities are the probability that y is equal to t. And the denominator is going to be the probability that z is equal to this value t that you drew. Let me just comment that if the supports of y and z are not equal, then the privacy loss random variable is undefined because, you know, if uh, one thing has non-zero mass and the other has zero mass, then this will be infinite and uh, or it, it'll be undefined, actually, the ratio. So kind of consider them over the same supports. But yeah, really, the main thing you should note is that you kind of draw something from the numerator and check out, you know, the probability ratio between seeing it from uh, the uh, random variable that's in the numerator, that's y, versus the random variable that's in the denominator, that's z. Uh, a few comments here before we do a sort of example to see what uh, the privacy loss random variable could be. Um, so a few comments. One, I say this as probability that y is equal to t, z is equal to t. This is kind of for discrete random variables. You can imagine it also holds for uh, continuous, you can define this also for continuous random variables by considering the ratio of the PDF at those points. Furthermore, like I said, you know, if the supports are not equal, one thing has a non-zero probability at something and the other has zero probability, um, then the variable will be undefined. But I might casually say that the privacy loss is infinite, this is sort of informal, um, but I'll, uh, that, that's what I might say sometimes. So uh, yeah. Uh, so it also holds for continuous. And uh, you can also say that undefined is sort of like a infinity privacy loss in for some cases. OK, uh, what else will I say? Like, OK, I stated this in terms of general y and z. But generally, we're going to picture, as you might guess, by the same sort of thing we've done been doing before that uh, you know, y is going to be a differentially private algorithm or just an algorithm run on uh, some data set x. And z is going to be an algorithm run on a neighboring data set uh, x prime. Uh, this is kind of you know, the, the same type of uh, thing we've done so many more times before. So like, you know, take a look at the ratio. Uh, th this is like the natural thing. It, it kind of matches up. So how should we interpret uh, the privacy loss uh, random variable? It's kind of saying that suppose we draw some value uh, t, then it tells you how much more likely it was that that uh, value came from uh, the numerator versus the de denominator's random variable. So for example, if we, we specialize it to this, it tells you how much more likely the input data set was x versus the input data set being uh, x prime. OK, so that's what the privacy loss random variable is. Let's, uh, let's, let's delve into it a bit more. How does this correspond to, uh, to differential privacy? And essentially, all the differential privacy guarantees we've seen so far are kind of just saying that, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of saying that, uh, you know, you have some sort of control over this privacy loss random variable. So for example, Let's uh, see what it means in terms of uh, pure differential privacy. So when we have epsilon dp, uh, say epsilon dp of m, that's sort of equivalent to saying the following that, uh, you know, L of uh, m on x and x prime is less than or equal to epsilon with probability one uh, for all x, x prime, which are neighbors. So what does that say? It sort of says that, you know, if you substitute in, uh, if, if you put in any uh, data sets x and x prime here, then it says that the realization can only increase your uh, probability of saying uh, uh, the evidence that it's either y or that the input data set is either x or x prime by a factor of e to the epsilon in one way or the other. So this is this is very intuitively like uh, what we've seen before. 
And let's let's uh, see what this looks like for an actual. This might be a little bit abstract. I, I found it a little bit abstract the first time I learned about it. But let's see kind of what um, what what this actually looks like as a privacy loss random variable. So let's start with you know let let's start with our favorite algorithm so far, which is the Laplace mechanism. So what we're going to say is that this is say uh, what do I want to do? Let's use some colors here. So let's use this uh, nice green. So we'll say that this is the distribution. Uh, this one here. This one is m on x. This is like the Laplace mechanism. So we just have some, you know, point for the true uh, query, and you add Laplace noise around it, and Suppose we have that this is uh, m on some x prime. So it's a slightly, it's a somewhat different distribution. But these are these are the probabilities of uh, seeing every outcome. Okay, so this is not the privacy loss random variable, but this is just saying what is you know the probability of seeing uh, this value under m of x, and this is the random variable. This is the PDF of m of x prime, telling you what the probability of seeing any outcome is with this. So, okay, let's uh, let's see about this. Now, suppose the the like just looking at the privacy loss random variable definition again, we kind of draw something according to the thing in the numerator, uh, and then output what the ratio is. So essentially, what we're going to do, uh, let's let's just put some numbers here, and just for simplicity. Let's say this is say one uh, in terms of, you know, the query non-privatized is sort of centered at one. And let's say that this one is going to be zero. Okay, so now based on what the privacy loss random variable has defined is, uh, what we're going to do is essentially uh, draw a sample from this green distribution here, emma of x, and then output what the ratio uh, between it and the other thing is, and the other uh, m on x prime is. So for example, let's take a look at, say we sample, uh, you know, draw a sample from this and we have, uh, you, we have something that lands right here. Well, what is the ratio of this point to this point? I claim that uh, this ratio, I'm not gonna prove this, but this is basically just from the definition of the Laplace mechanism and the Laplace random variable. I claim that the ratio of these is equal to e to the epsilon. And in fact, that will hold, I claim, again, you'll have to check this, um, that you know the ratio of anything uh, that's to the right of this is going to be uh, e to the epsilon ratio for anything here. So let's take a look at what this looks like in, our, in terms of our privacy loss random variable. So this is going to be uh, L on M X and M on X prime. And this will be the probability uh, density function of this, uh, of this random variable. Let's say P of T. So what we saw here is essentially if uh, m takes a value, sorry, if m on x takes a value that is sort of greater than or equal to uh, its mean, then I claim that you can check this yourself that the ratio here will be uh, e to the epsilon. And so therefore, since we look at the log of that for the um, privacy loss random variable, that means there's going to be a point mass at epsilon, which has probability equal to I guess this will be, I, th I think this will be say one and a half. Don't quote me on that, but I think that should be right. On the other hand, the claim is that uh, anything to the left of uh, zero has a similar, uh, it has a similar ratio, but in the opposite direction. So the ratio of this to this will be uh, e to the minus epsilon this time. So in particular, you know, anything that lies to the left of, uh, of zero will be e to the minus epsilon in terms of the ratio. 
Note that this is a lower probability event coming on out from uh, uh, since you know it's just the probability that uh, this green distribution comes out in this tail. So we're going to have something like less than one half here, but this will be a point mass uh, at minus epsilon. And then there's going to be some density which sort of connects the two. I'm, I'm not going to sketch it because it gets a little bit technical, but like it, it looks maybe, maybe something like the, like this. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it could be a Laplace distribution. I, I'm not going to get into too much of what it looks like between those two. You can do the calculations yourself to see what the privacy loss random variable looks like there. Um, but yeah, the point is there's sort of going to be two point masses here uh, at epsilon and minus epsilon, and it'll have some support between those two. Uh, and the thing is, like I said before, epsilon differential privacy of an algorithm M implies that uh, the privacy loss random variable is bounded by epsilon with probability one, which we can see is indeed uh, true in this case, because you saw, you saw it, anything outside of that is impossible. So succinctly, epsilon differential privacy says that the absolute value, oh, sorry, this is one thing I should clarify, is that the absolute value of the uh, privacy loss random variable is less than or equal to epsilon. Yeah, that's very important because, um, you know, sometimes it's going to be more likely, sometimes it's going to be less likely than the alternative. But it's always gives, it always gives you a sort of a benefit, uh, an advantage over random guessing of at most uh, epsilon in some sense. Okay, so that's pure differential privacy and the sort of equivalence uh, between that and a bound on the um, privacy loss random variable. And that's kind of just immediate if you look at the definition of pure differential privacy and see how it corresponds to uh, bounds on this privacy loss random variable. Um, slightly less obvious is the following correspondence. I claim that this epsilon delta differential privacy uh, corresponds to the following uh, property of uh, the privacy loss random variable. Similarly, we're going to say that it's less than or equal to epsilon, but now with probability only one minus delta and for all you know, x, x prime neighbors. So the idea is that one, one way to interpret this is saying that uh, you know, the, the privacy loss is usually bounded with probability one minus delta, but with probability delta, something you know, bad could happen. Uh, so it might be very not private in that case. And we'll see some examples of what can happen with this probability delta in a sec. So again, this is, this is not at all a trivial uh, statement uh, that, you know, this is, it, it's not super hard, but it's also not trivial. Um, I can refer you to lemma uh, 3.17 of uh, Dwork Roth in case if you want to see that proven. One direction of this equivalence is kind of easy, the other one is not so easy. But yeah, it says that the privacy loss random variable is bounded by epsilon with probability one minus delta. Now, the mystery at this point is what, what really happens when this probability delta bad event happens? You know, is this, is this going to be like death and destruction? Is this going to be the end of the world? Or is this uh, kind of not gonna be so bad? Well, there's actually a wide range of possible options and we'll look at them sort of one by one. In particular, we'll start by seeing uh, kind of the worst possible case. I'll tell you a very, a very silly, stupid algorithm which, uh, which, uh, which satisfies epsilon delta differential privacy, but we can see just how bad things can be. So I'll define an algorithm as follows. So m on x, uh, which will output the following. Uh, it'll just output zero with probability uh, one minus delta or it'll output x, that is the entire data set, with probability uh, delta. So you can see, uh, well, looking at this sort of informally in terms of, uh, in terms of the privacy loss random variable, we're not going to go through the entire calculation right now. But, you know, let's, let's see what the privacy is. Um, imagine you draw m on x and m on some x prime. Well, the probability that Sorry, yeah, let's, let's do this a little bit carefully. So the probability that uh, M, so well, let's see how to do this. So we can say that M of X is equal to zero with probability uh, one minus delta. And in this case, the privacy loss uh, random variable 
L on M uh, X uh, M on X prime is equal to zero when this happens. And it should be clear why, because um, this also happens with probability one minus delta under any other uh, data set as well. So, you know, it'll be uh, one minus delta divided by one minus delta, uh, take the log of that, and that'll give you zero. So you can see that indeed with probability one minus delta, we have that the privacy loss random variable is going to be uh, less than epsilon, in particular, it'll be zero. Um, so we've already shown that this is zero delta dp. However, uh, you can see that this is not really private in these, this other case at all. It returns the entire uh, it, it returns the entire data set. So this doesn't really uh, this doesn't seem like a very private algorithm for you know non negligible values of delta. So this sort of gives us a first guess that you know delta should be small and quite small, in fact. How small should it be? Well, we'll we'll use this. Uh, we'll we'll do a little bit more of an interesting example. Um, this is kind of silly, but let's uh, talk a bit more of an interesting example, uh, which we'll call name and shame. I believe this name was invented by Adam Smith. Uh, that's my guess. Uh, he's the only one I've seen use it, and I like it. But okay, so in particular, uh, this kind of example will show that uh, delta being greater than one over n, where n is the number of uh, points in the data set. Uh, this is bad, and we really want delta to be at the very biggest possible, like you know, one o one over n, maybe one over a hundred n. Otherwise, um, you know, pretty bad things can happen. And let's see why. We're going to do we're we're going to you know go over uh, an algorithm which is uh, slightly more interesting than the previous one, but uh, not a huge amount. We'll see. So we're going to call it n s delta, name and shame delta. Um, what this does is the following. It'll uh, be defined as follows. Uh, so step one, it'll uh, iterate over its algorithm. It'll it'll iter iterate over its entire input. Um, so n of s of x for each x in this data set that uh, we are iterating over. We're going to do the following uh, with probability delta independently for each uh, individual or for each data point, just output x in the clear. And otherwise, with probability 1 minus delta, you know, do nothing. So it's a very simple algorithm. Essentially, we just go through the data set and output each thing, each individual's data with independently with probability delta. Um, yeah, and this input, what, what, what their data could be is something very sensitive. For example, it could be a database uh, consisting of people's uh, social security number, their like, private emails or something like that. So one thing we're going to claim uh, for now and we'll prove in a sec is that ns of delta is, uh, we'll, we'll claim that this is uh, similarly to before. It's a little bit harder of a proof this time. It's zero delta differentially private. So we're going to prove this in a sec, but uh, let's see how what what this does. Like, what does this algorithm actually end up outputting? Does it output you know a lot of people's things? Does it output uh, no one's data? What does it do? Uh, here, but the claim is that uh, well, we'll prove that one later. But claim two will be that um, with probability approximately equal to delta n. Uh, n s of delta outputs something. In particular, it'll output uh, someone's personal private data. So we can see that you know if 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 this algorithm outputs someone's data point exactly, then I guess I personally wouldn't consider that a reasonable or a strong privacy guarantee. So let let's see why this is, and then we'll talk about it a bit more. Well, okay, let's uh, sort of build this up step by step. The probability that each individual thing is, uh, each individual data point is released is delta. The probability that uh, a data point is not released is that therefore one minus delta. Now, since we want, if putting this together, since they're independent events for all n uh, data points, 
the probability that no data point is released is one minus delta to the n, since there's n total data points. Since there's a probability that uh, it, uh, no data point is released, the probability that at least one data point is released is this, one minus one minus delta to the n. If you're not familiar with this calculation, you should do it yourself and convince yourself. This is a common type of calculation. And the claim is just by some sort of Taylor expansion uh, as usual, the claim is that this is approximately equal to delta times n for a sufficiently small delta, let's say. Um, yeah, if you pick like delta equals one half, then you can see that this is obviously bad, but say like, you know, delta being fairly small, this is going to be approximately equal to delta times n. Okay, so let's interpret this. This means that, you know, if suppose delta is equal to say like, uh, let's say one over 10 n, that says with probability one over 10, then uh, someone's data will be uh, output. So if we want this to be, you know, much, much less than one, then we require that, uh, you know, delta is much, much less than one over n. So if we don't want to output anyone's data in the clear, then maybe we want to pick a fairly small delta, like less than one over n. Yeah, and in particular, like maybe a reasonable setting would be say, you know, delta is something like one over n to the 1.1, this could be okay. But often we might think to, to draw a parallel or a connection with another subfield of, uh, sec of security, you know, cryptography. Uh, maybe sometimes we think of uh, delta as being cryptographically small. This is sort of a common uh, term in uh, crypto where this kind of means maybe it, it means that maybe it's like exponentially small in n or at least uh, quasi polynomially small in n, something like, uh, you know, two to the minus uh, log squared of n, something like that. So we generally think of t delta being pretty small due to this example. Now let's, uh, let's actually prove uh, claim one here and show that it's zero delta differentially private. Uh, this is going to be following a presentation due to Smith, which I cite in the lecture notes, but let's, uh, let's see how we would do it. So consider any two neighboring data sets, X and X prime, our favorite symbols for these, which differ in entry I. So they're equal otherwise, but entry I is the one that uh, differs. So with that, let's say that T is a set of data points. This is essentially going to be corresponding to, uh, you know, the output of the algorithm. We're going to say that, you know, we're, we're going to measure the probability that uh, the algorithm outputs essentially the set exactly T. And the last thing we're going to uh, need is the event E. So E is the event that entry I is output. So remember, this, this is going to be kind of like a one if, uh, if entry I is output and a zero otherwise. Note that this is the only uh, entry which they differ in. So in particular, if you don't output entry i, then the two distributions are essentially indistinguishable because you know whatever else happens, uh, it could have been from either one of the two, which happens with equal probability. So this is an informal argument, but let's make that a bit more formal. So the claim is conditioning on condition on bar e, that is the event that uh, entry i is not output, uh, then, you know, and the, the name and shame algorithm delta on X, like the input output distribution is equal to, uh, the name and shame uh, delta on X prime. And yeah, the reason for this is that, uh, you know, they're identical except for the ith entry and each thing is, uh, output uh, with probability delta exactly independently for each entry. So this shouldn't be too hard to see. So with that uh, in mind, then let's actually, you know, formally do the proof that uh, 
you know, it's epsilon delta dp. And we'll do this using the, uh, the like original definition of uh, approximate dp, not the privacy loss notion of it. So, okay, let's uh, go over that. So the way we do it every time is always gonna be, it's always like this. You know, what is the probability that name and shame on uh, input x is going to be in some set uh, t? That means that like, essentially, that uh, what is the probability that the output is equal to uh, some specific set of data points? Well, let's break it up by conditioning on this event, uh, like using the what's called the law of total probability. So, this is a simple, uh, this is a classic, uh, you know, probability 101, but for any sort of uh, conditioning on any sort of event, you can break up a probability like this. Uh, essentially, you pick a set of events which are disjoint and form a un and their union form sort of like a you know the overall probability space. So either E happens and or it doesn't happen and you sort of take the conditional probability times the probability of uh, that event happening. So okay let's look at each of these two terms. Well the first thing we'll note is that uh, we'll use this statement here conditioning on E bar then the distribution of the two uh, the two um, algorithms is going to be the same. And sorry, I just realized I used S here. Um, let's, let's use the notation that I've actually been using before. Let's change this to T because that's the sort of set of outputs. Okay, with that done. So let's use this fact that conditioning on E bar, then the two distributions are equal first. So this will go from being NS delta on X. This will be NS delta on X prime now. Uh, is in T conditioning on E bar times probability of E bar. No, yeah. And then the other term, we're just going to leave that as is. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, the probability of some of these events. In particular, what can we say here? We can say that this is a probability, so it's less than or equal to one. This is less than or equal to one. Uh, this we know the probability of E happening. E is the event that the entry I is output. So this is equal exactly to delta. And uh, this event here, probability bar e. This is again a probability, so this is less than or equal to one. So what we get here is that this is less than or equal to probability ns delta on x prime. And plus the probability that, sorry, this is going to just be plus delta. Yeah, okay, note, note that actually one thing I did here was I you know used the fact that uh, this is essentially, sorry, there was one thing I did here that I didn't write out here. Um, this term multiplying these two, I didn't actually use the fact that the probability uh, is less than or equal to one here. What I did was the fact that this can be written as uh, the, this former product here can be written as a probability of not E uh, bar E as well as uh, the NS delta X prime being in T. So the conjunction of those two events, this and that, and that's always less than or equal to the probability, probability of just one of the two events happening. That's how that, uh, that inequality happened. But okay. Uh, taking a step back, what have we shown now? We've shown that the probability of some event of some set of out data points being output under X 
is less than or equal to that set of uh, that output happening under you know a neighboring data set plus delta. So this is exactly you know the thing that we wanted to show, which is zero delta dp. Okay, so this these are, have been two interesting examples. Uh, let's let's take a look again at what happens when uh, in these two cases. So the first case when we have uh, this event that happens with probability delta, we can see it's a disaster. We release the entire data set uh, x. Similarly here, this type of uh, delta probability event uh, kind of corresponds to people's data being released in the clear, which is kind of also similarly a catastrophic failure type event. So in both of these cases, the privacy loss random variable is essentially either zero or infinity with probability delta. Um, which shows that, you know, things can go horribly wrong with this probability delta. So how do we interpret delta? You know, if you don't have any uh, further information, then you have to be a little bit pessimistic. You know, like uh, disaster with probability delta. Which is why that we think of, you know, delta, they mentioned delta is going to be small or even cryptographically small, because you really don't want this to happen. It's like uh, you, you violate everyone's privacy or you lose a lot of privacy in this case. That said, there are many common algorithms which say things de de uh, degrade nice nicely. So like, uh, you, it may not be that bad. Like, uh, for example, maybe you know you have some sort of privacy guarantee which looks something like this. Like, well, let's, let's, uh, I'm just going to sketch out what the privacy loss random variable could look like. Um, you know, let's, let's just draw some things here. This is a very uh, rough sketch, but epsilon uh, minus epsilon epsilon. Maybe, okay, so is the disaster case, let's do that in uh, green here. So the disaster case might look like something like this, you know, some, something like this. Uh, you know, see, it's always bounded between minus epsilon and epsilon, but then with probability delta, you know, you have something way out here. Let's draw it way out here. So you have this with probability uh, delta. So this is the for the for former type of uh, you know interpretation of delta, but on the other hand, maybe it's not so bad. Like maybe you have something that looks kind of like uh, this. So let me write this like. This is the sort of disaster delta. Whereas on the other hand, maybe you have something uh, which is nicer in some cases, like, I don't know, maybe it's a nice rapidly decaying distribution, which looks something like this, which you can see that it falls outside of the range minus epsilon to epsilon with some probability. But even if it falls outside that, it doesn't seem like it falls very far outside of that. So, you know, maybe this is a nicer uh, privacy guarantee than you might have here. So, for example, like, um, I, I don't know, this, this can be specified in some ways that we've already seen. For example, maybe you compute uh, the privacy loss here. And so this is like, this tells you that this is like, uh, just, just basically using this as a threshold, maybe this algorithm orange is simultaneously both epsilon delta dp. But maybe you can also say that this is like, uh, you know, maybe this line is 1.1 um, epsilon. And then this mass here in the tail is going to be delta over two or something. So simultaneously, it could have multiple uh, epsilon delta privacy guarantees. Something like this. This is sort of a way you could express multiple different privacy guarantees of a nicely behaved uh, algorithm um, in this type of setting, though this is a little bit crude. In particular, like it, it, it sort of tells you a crude threshold, you know, once you go past a certain uh, privacy loss, then uh, this is how much mass you get in the tail. On the other hand, uh, there's nicer characterizations. For example, there's other things known as Renyi DP and concentrated DP, which we'll talk about probably later in this class, which say that uh, you know if 
the, the privacy loss random variable is sub Gaussian, meaning that, you know, you, you kind of have a collection of many of these type of epsilon delta guarantees. Uh, and it says that it decays sufficiently fast. Okay, so before we move on to uh, epsilon, uh, be before we move on to the Gaussian mechanism, which is kind of the canonical um, approximate DP algorithm, let's uh, just comment on one difference between pure DP and approximate DP. Let's go back to the definition, in fact. In the definite, like, rem remember we always do this thing where we say probability m of x in some set t, and, you know, we, we say this less than or equal to, uh, like, e to, the, e to the epsilon probability of m on x prime in t. So this, this is the way we usually do it, but it's actually, like, equivalent or sufficient to just uh, say, that like um, for, for pure DP, we can do this as, you know, is equal to some event T instead. So not saying that it lands in some set, but say that it has some particular outcome. However, um, under approximate DP, we can't actually do this and it has to actually be considering sets. Uh, and to see why that is, let's, uh, let's, let's see why that is by a simple example. So suppose here's, here's another one of our silly straw man algorithms. But suppose, suppose, you know, m on x outputs the following uh, tuple. So it outputs simultaneously x and some, so it outputs the entire data set. And it also outputs s, where s is uh, from uh, the following distribution. So we say that it outputs first the whole the whole data set, and then additionally a uh, single you know random number drawn uniformly from the range one to one over d. So let me just comment that you can see that the probability of any individual outcome happening is going to be equal to uh, or you know at most one it'll be happen with at most probability delta just because of the fact that um, you know the second thing in the tuple whatever it is comes up with probability at most delta. So therefore, we would have, you know, uh, we, we would have this type of guarantee uh, just because of the fact that, uh, you know, each individual event happens with probability either zero or uh, delta. So therefore, you know, we have this sort of additive guarantee. But on the other hand, you know, this, this isn't really very private at all because it outputs the entire data set X. So you kind of really need to consider for epsilon delta dp, you really need to consider this uh, set definition. Otherwise, you'll get uh, silly things like this. So yeah, you really want it to be um, in some set t. We'll note that, uh, as, a, as a final note, I'll say that, you know, if you really want to think about it in terms of individual outcomes, uh, individual like events, the probability that the algorithm is equal to something, then you can do that using the privacy loss random variable definition instead, which allows you to work in that way. But if you want to use the original epsilon delta differential privacy notion, uh, the, the way it's originally formulated, then you can't consider individual events because of silly examples like this. Cool. So that concludes our first part of the lecture where we talked about approximate differential privacy and sort of what it is and some ideas of how to think of delta. In the next component, we're going to move on to the Gaussian mechanism, which is the sort of canonical algorithm for approximate differential privacy.